I, like I said, will you be attending? I just checked yes on the court. Um, no. Go back this year to the class. And I'll explain you. Oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> Here 
I have C, A, and one of these is B, and one of these is B. So I see that I've cut this into two, uh, sorry, into four pieces. Once I cut them, I can now rearrange these pieces into each other. And we call this equity decomposability. Great word. <laughs> Anytime you can get lots of syllables into a word, let me know it's good. You should speak Hungarian then. <laughs> Personal. Okay, so. I only know one word in Hungarian. <laughs> Means thank you. <laughs> you know, Hungarian, I, so I, I, I get distracted a lot when I talk, but Hungarian is one of those weird languages. It's a, it's a Uralic language, so it means it's not really related to anything. Like, so there's Hungarian, Estonian, and Finnish, which are just all bizarre. Anyways. <clears throat> so maybe we should be more precise about what we mean to decompose. We see that, in this case, we could do everything just by cutting along straight lines. And you might ask, you know, so if that's good enough for this, maybe we should just require that. Okay, so in other words, at no point were we going to make some cut, which looked wibbly and wobbly. Okay, so that is not what
Um, one thing that you can do constructively is you can compute something called a delay triangulation. But I'm not sure if that comes after this. I think that comes after this. So the second step is now to take any triangle and uh, turn it into a rectangle. So take a triangle. Turn it into a rectangle. So if I have a triangle, what I have to do, it doesn't need to be acute, but let me put the two acute angles on the bottom. What I can do, here I guess I should finally use colors, is I take, so if this is the height of my triangle, I want to turn it, in, in order to get the right area, I need to turn it into a rectangle which has just that height divided by 2. So that has height of h over 2. And automatically, I have my answer, which is just uh, that, uh, what am I trying to say? Which is just that this piece, so I've drawn this pretty poorly, but you can verify that A matches up with A and B. So okay, my yellow line is not quite straight, so this picture isn't accurate. But then you can convince yourself that these, they both have height h over 2, and they're clearly sitting there driving. Now the third step is to take all the rectangles into each other. So I can take any rectangle that I want, and turn it into a rectangle, any other rectangle of the same area. So how do I do this? <clears throat> Suppose I have two rectangles of the same area. I'm going to draw them on top of each other. So here is my one rectangle, my one rectangle with side lengths A and B. And I take my other rectangle of the same area with side lengths C and D. And what I can do is I can just take the straight line between these two vertices. So let's look at this line. That's just B minus D, right? If just if this whole length is B, then this part of it is D. And let's look at this length, star. Let's call it X. Well, this height here is C minus A. And if I look at this triangle and this larger triangle, those are two similar triangles. So I have that x divided by c minus a is equal to uh, b divided by c. Or in other words, x is equal to b times uh, c minus a over c, which I'll write as 1 minus uh, a over c. Writing this out, so if I expand this, this is b minus ab over c. But I said that they have the same areas. So ab equals cd. It's floating around up here. When I substitute that back in, I get that this is b minus d. So what I found is that this triangle is exactly the same as this triangle because they're similar and they have the same thing. And that means that if I look at this triangle, this yellow triangle bounded with the pink, I can just slide it down here and that will fill the other side. Does everyone see that? Literally just take this and just slide it out. And you can 
you don't even need to really check that they have the same side lengths just because they're similar and they have the same area. All right, so what have we done? We've decomposed our pieces of triangles, and each triangle we decompose into rectangles, and from those rectangles, we can make any other rectangle. So for each triangle, so four is to combine everything, for each triangle, form a rectangle using two, Then, using 3, you can turn it into a 1 times L rectangle. So now I have a bunch of pieces which have the same length, and I can just stack those on top of each other. So for all of these triangles, I stack these pieces on top of each other, and that gives me a 1 times area of the starting figure rectangle. And finally, we use three again to get our nice square. After it's clean. Was that the idea that all three authors use? Sorry? Was that the idea that all three authors use? You know, I don't know. I believe that the, that the idea of triangulating and then sort of turning things into rectangles is used by all authors. I don't think that this exact set of steps is, you know, maybe this is my take on it, um, but um, I believe they're all similar, but I could be wrong, so don't, uh, don't record it for posterity. <laughs> Any other questions? I should point out, uh, maybe I'll email the math club. There's a great uh, thing that Moira actually sent me recently, which animates this, uh, this sort of process. And I'll, I'll send that out. It's a lot of fun to go. So what's the natural thing to do? The natural thing to do is to ask, what about higher dimensions? And Hilbert's third problem does exactly that. So Hilbert's third problem asks, are two polyhedra of the same model? Scissors congruent, or I can decompose them. You might be interested in the case of the unit cube and a tetrahedron of equal area. So I guess this has side length one, and I forget the volume of a tetrahedron, so I'll write it out. Cube root of six root two. Okay, fun exercise. It turns out that people thought about it for a while and they couldn't see anything. They couldn't see any sort of obvious way in order to do this. And, um, you know, so Hilbert formed this problem and it was part of what I recall, I'm sure many of you have heard of Hilbert's uh, 23 problems, which he proposed. So I guess I should put a year. Um, well, it's kind of unfair to put this, 1900, but it does make the story a little bit better. He published his list of 23 problems in 1900, and he gave a talk on 10 of them at the International Congress of Mathematicians, which occurs every four years since, I think that was the second one, but um, it has occurred since. Uh, maybe with some exceptions, like during World War II or something. Um, but he thought that these problems would be influential and would challenge mathematicians for a long time. Among them, there are still three that are considered uh, stated not vaguely, but also not solved at all, one of which is the Riemann hypothesis, which is certainly influential. Um, but the first one to go was this problem. So 
uh, uh, Dane came along, and Dane, Max Dane, was Hilbert's student, and he solved the problem. In what year? I need help. So, okay, it's a little bit unfair to say this problem had been in the aether for a while, and I believe Hilbert probably actually asked this problem two years earlier or something like that. But, okay, but still, you know, for a list of problems that includes the Riemann hypothesis, solving a problem two years later is a pretty big job. <clears throat> So this takes us to the second part of the talk, which is algebra. Because in order to understand Dane's idea, what we have to do is we have to take a trip into the algebraic world. So let me define an abelian group. How many of you know what an abelian group is already? Okay. So an abelian group is a set, uh, maybe I'll say it's a pair, uh, let's say A comma plus, consisting of a set A and uh, a binary operation, I'll just say an operation When I say plus, you probably have thoughts of, you know, 2 plus 3 is 5, and that's a good sort of thought to have, because, indeed, the integers form an abelian group. Uh, so, okay, so this operation has to satisfy some properties. What properties does it need to satisfy? One, uh, what's the first thing I should say? Um, it's usually important for these, okay. So it should be associated. I mean, people often say it should be closed under addition, but I mean, if it's a binary operation, often you'll just say that. So if you know what that means, then don't worry about it. And if you don't work, know what that means, then also don't worry about it. Because you'll sort of have it automatically if you don't think about it. Too much. So associative just means that if I take two elements of the set and I add the first two first, and then I add the third one, I get same thing, composing the other way. It has an identity element, uh, which I'll call zero, such that zero plus a is equal to a plus zero is equal to a. And uh, three, it has inverses. So for each A, there is an element which we'll call minus A, such that A plus minus A is equal to zero, and minus A plus A is equal to zero. If I stop here, we would just call this a group. But we're in the process of abelian. So let's make things abelian. It's got to be commutative. Commutative means that if I take A plus B, I also get B plus A. Now this seems like maybe just some sort of, you know, abstract why do we care sort of thing, but it turns out that it encodes a lot of very nice um, things in it. So some examples. Uh, well, one, I can take just the integers with addition. So um, I know that addition is associative, Zero in the integers is the identity element. For every, if I have three, then minus three is its inverse. And it's commutative. One plus four is equal to four plus one. That's certainly true. You can, also, you can of course, also do this with rational numbers. 
or real numbers. One thing that you can also do is you can take r minus 0, so you can take all non-zero real numbers, and you use multiplication. <clears throat> so here, the identity element, the zero element that I said is actually 1, goes by the name 1, which might be a little bit confusing, but nonetheless, uh, you can still think about it as a 0. Um, We can take z mod pz. So what does that do? If I take my integer z, and I imagine them sort of, OK, they're going off. Here they are. And at some point, maybe I'll change this to an n, because it doesn't need to be prime. And I change it at some point. And when I get back here, I set 8 to be equal to 0, and 9 to be equal to 1, and 10 to be equal to 2, and so on around. And similarly, going backwards, minus 1 is equal to 7. So if I do that, this thing would be called z mod 8z, because I associated 0 and 8 together. And what I can do is, if I want to add, say I want to add 3 and 4, well, I just get 7, and that just brings me here. Say I want to add 4 and 5, well, I would get 9, which is the same thing as 1. So I just consider those to be the same numbers. So in other words, a plus b is like a plus b mod n. And that still forms an abelian group. Here's one example that probably, if you've taken an algebra course, you don't necessarily think about these things uh, uh, so much, because a lot of what you do is you spend time thinking about finitely generated things. But nonetheless, you can take r mod 2 pi z. So I start, I do the same thing. I start at 0. And I go, maybe I should even draw it. There's 0. And I go around, and here's pi, and pi over 2, and uh, 3 pi over 2. And when I get back to 2 pi, I just consider that to be the same thing. I keep winding around. So all of these elements, I, I take my r with its usual addition, and I just associate these elements together, and it turns out that addition still works on this thing. It doesn't matter which number up to adding multiples of 2 pi, to still get the same answer. Let's <clears throat> One thing that you might not have thought about so much, but I'll say it anyway, is something like, R mod Q. Okay. So if I take R mod Q, what am I doing? I'm taking all real numbers, and then I'm saying associate them. So I take all real numbers, and I associate, so I consider x and y to be the same. If x minus y is a rational number. And then I have the same sort of addition structure. So this is some wildly crazy set. In fact, it's, it's sort of interesting. You can ask, does this have cardinality larger than the real numbers? I mean, it's a quotient of it. And it turns out that if you sort of drop the axiom of choice, then that's not even necessarily true. So, um, so this is some wacky set. Well, R star mod Q star. R star mod Q star, right. So OK. Any questions about that? Um, so let me fix some notation. So if I have an abelian, an abelian group A plus, and I have an element in it, X, and I have some number N and Z, then I'm going to set n dot x equal to just x plus x and so on plus x n times. Okay, you might ask what if n is 0 or negative. Okay. Right. So this totally makes sense if n is positive. If n is 0, just set it to be 0. 
And if n is negative, you use minus x's instead. Okay. So is that clear or should I write that down? Okay, great. So with this notation, what I want to define for you is the tensor product of the Boolean groups. So suppose I have two abelian groups A and B, and I want to form the tensor product. So I note this, I note this as A tensor over Z with B. So what does an element in here look like? So an element in there looks like the following.
Well, I can actually sum them by this property, the first property here, to get one tensor A1 plus A2, and so on, through AK. Yeah? Um, wouldn't you need to be able to like uh, switch uh, inverses between across the tensor product in order for that to work? This couldn't n be negative? So you, yeah, so n can be negative in this formula. That's totally okay. fine. Okay. What that's saying is that a well, tensor we'll minus b is okay. minus a tensor b. And maybe I might do this automatically later, so maybe I should say it now that you remind me. Sometimes you just call this n times a tensor b because it doesn't matter where I put the n. So I can think about it as just n times this L. So from this equation, I see that every element is of the form. 1 tensor a for some a and a. Let me write that down so that it doesn't sound like a topology. So a in capital A. And the addition is just adding in this second factor. So I see that capital A and these elements are just the same thing. How about if I take z mod 4z tensor z mod 60 Well, let's look at an element like 2 tensor 3 Just some element what is this? I can write this as 2 on 1 tensor 3. It's 2 acting on 1. And so that's equal to 1 tensor 2 times 3. And that is just 0. Well, maybe I'll write technically 1 tensor 0. And this is just 0 in the group. Whenever you know, I have a 0 here, I can think about this as 0 times 0. So I can shift the zero over. So once I have zero, zero. So no question. Yeah. So tensor product takes two groups and gives you a group. Yes, it takes in this it takes two abelian groups okay. and gives you an abelian group. Okay. So there's a more general construction where I can take a module over a ring and tensor it over that ring with another module. And there's some order that matters unless the ring's commutative. There's a whole story. But here we're just taking Z modules, which are the same thing as a If that makes sense to anyone, not the same okay. How about something like 1 tensor 5? So this I can think about as 1 tensor 5 acting on 1. And I can shift the 5 over. And so that gives me 5 acting on 1, tensor 1. And 5 acting on 1 in Z mod 4Z is just 1. It's 1 tensor 1. And what you can check is that any even tensor anything, or anything tensor even, gives me 0. Whereas the remaining case, an odd tensor in odd, gives me one tensor one. So I get an abelian group with two elements. There's only one of those, it turns out. Just z mod 2 z. Every element is either zero or one tensor one. So all of this is leading up to a rather complicated object which is R tensor over Z with R mod 2 pi Z. So this is probably uh, you know, something, I mean this is something somewhat uh, forward I would say. But just to give you an example, if I take three, if I take square root of two 
comprehensive with pi. I should, I should make this a pi is easy to be totally correct. So maybe let me do a pi over 2 here. Well, I can think about the square root of 2 as 2 times square root of 2 tends to be pi over 2. And so I can shift the 2 over to the other side. We get square root of 2 tends to be pi. But pi is just 0. Yeah? Why do you think of square root of 2 as 2 times square root of 2? Oh, 2 times square root of 2 over 2. Okay. Right. Thank you. I hope that's <laughs> So the point is, anytime I have a, a rational number times pi on the right-hand side, I just get zero. If I don't have a rational number times pi on the right-hand side, then I don't get zero. So that's a little bit harder. So um, if I have so let me write that, a times pi times the rational is equal to zero, and a and uh, a tensor. Uh, pi times an irrational is not equal to zero. So that's a cute little exercise, but uh, won't say much more about it. That's all we need to know. Any questions going on? OK. So what was Dane's idea? Okay. We've now seen. Scissors congruence in two dimensions. We've seen some algebra, just the algebra that was sort of necessary to frame Dane's idea. Now, in the third part, let's go back to Dane's idea. Well, okay. When we say, when we phrased the problem, the first thing that we did was we said these two polyhedrons have to save, have the same volume. What we're doing in that is we're implicitly saying there's already an invariant, right? So. The question can be phrased, is there an invariant of a polyhedron under cutting, under decomposition, which is not just the volume? Once you go searching for something like this, there's a very natural idea. So let's consider some polyhedron. Uh, some polyhedron, there it is. I look at an edge. Sorry, it's fine. <laughs> And to each edge, I have two numbers. I have its length, and I have its angle. So by the angle, I mean the dihedral angle, the angle that's swept out between the two planes. Okay. Or in other words, if I look at the normal vectors to the two faces, the angle between those two normals, those two normal uh, directions. And the idea is that I just form an invariant by sort of formally taking a tensor product. And the question is, where am I actually taking this tensor product? Am I taking it over R tensor over Z with R? And it turns out that if you look at what cutting preserves, it actually tells you automatically what the relations that you need to satisfy are. And they're exactly those relations when you take this. So I'm going to sum this now over each edge and have it live in R tensor with R mod pi z. And Dane's idea was once I impose this, once I consider this to be living here, then this is an invariant of the polyhedron. So this is called the Dane invariant. Yeah. Sorry, so you, you first have to sh like prove somehow that there are two, like, some sort of polyhedron which cannot be formed or like, right. cut into each other. That's right. Right, otherwise, what's the point? 
Yeah, and, and so the question is, how can you distinguish them, right? Right, but like, a priori, how do we know that volume is not enough? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. Um, this problem, if you think about the, the history of this problem, right? In two dimensions, this was solved in the 1830s. Very classical sort of problem. So this thing had been floating around for a while uh, by the time that 1900 came around. And you know, whenever you work on a problem, a lot of times you think, can I do this? Like a lot of conjectures are motivated out of, I thought about it for a while, and I just couldn't do it. And what I suspect that Dane did was he said, let me think about the cube, and let me think about the tetrahedron, and try to chop them up. He tried and tried and tried and tried, and it turned out that there was something that was preventing him from doing that. The thing that was preventing him from doing that is actually precisely what's encoded in the Dane invariant. So once we, so now that we have this, I mean, you'll see exactly how it works. But it has something to do with the fact that, you know, when you cut, a, if, if you're looking along a face, you're always cutting so that two angles are summing up to pi. There's something going wrong with the way that things are fitting together. And if you make that precise, it's precisely encoded by the So. The, yeah, so it's a, good, it's a great question, and I think the answer is just you try for a while and you don't get anywhere, so somehow you're brilliant and you come up with this. Um, right. Uh, and I should make one remark, which is that uh, in 1965, so you know, 65 years later, it turns out that volume and the Damon invariant are the only invariants in three dimensions. And in four dimensions, similarly, there's another result from 1968 that some generalization of the data variant. But in higher dimensions, it's completely open. Yeah. Invariance of scissors. Of scissors decompositions. That's right. That's right. Exactly. OK, so the question is, why is this an invariant? And of course, the thing that you have to understand is what happens when we cut. Very similar, but instead, 
What you consider is when this plane now is tangent to your edge. Is it slicing through this edge? Maybe it's coming in kind of like this. There it is. Okay, well, the same argument about these pieces that I created hold, right? The th there's a theta side and a pi minus theta side. But along this edge, I've now taken L tensor theta and decomposed it into L tensor theta 1 plus L tensor theta 2, where theta 1 plus theta 2 is theta. So this is just L tensor theta. So for every single cut that I can make, a type 1 or type 2 thing, whenever I look at this local picture, I'm never changing this data invariant. Right? In, so, in some sense, taking this tensor product is exactly what I need in order to cook up this invariant. It's saying, oh, well, what did I need to say? I need to say that L tensor theta 1 and L tensor theta 2 was the same thing as L tensor theta. I needed to say that uh, L1 tensor theta plus L2 tensor theta was L tensor theta. And I needed that L tensor phi plus L tensor pi minus phi was equal to zero. And that's exactly where I'm going this invariant. So the punchline is that if I go back to that cube, it has side lengths 1, and the angles are all pi over 2. And there's 12 edges. So the Dane invariant of this is 12 times 1 tensor pi over 2. And I have a rational multiple of pi here. So this is equal to 0. The gain invariant of the cube is 0. And for the tetrahedron, with uh, side lengths uh, the fourth root of 6 root 2, and the dihedral angle, uh, so <coughs> Theta is arctan of 2 root 2, another good exercise. So this gain invariant is equal to 6 uh, times 1, uh, sorry, fourth root of 6 root 2, tensors with the arctan of 2 root 2. And this is not a rational multiple of pi. So this is non-zero. And so the answer is, not every two polyhedra of the same volume are equally decomposable. Thank you. Yeah, so you, you say it here that, okay, so A tensor irrational so pi is zero, A tensor irrational so pi is not equal to zero, so I know maybe to prove this, you need to do some more stuff. So I can tell you, um, so maybe this is for the people that, uh, that know a little bit of algebra, or maybe even, uh, uh, well, yeah, OK. So there's a way to phrase the tensor product in terms of abstract sort of nonsense, which is the following. Um, what is the tensor product? It states that, so first of all, there's a map from a times b to a tensor b. I, I just take a b to a tensor b. And if I have some other abelian group such that this is bilinear, then there exists a unique uh, uh, map morphism of abelian groups satisfying that this is commuted. So A tensor B is defined by this universal property. It's the only object such that there, this, this happens, such that there exists a unique map like this. So what I can do is I can consider the map R cross R mod 2 pi Z uh, to uh, sorry, R mod pi Q. 
which is just multiplication and then reduce mod pi t. So that's it. And that tells me that that should factor uniquely through the map r tensored over z with r mod pi z. And so if I look at what a times, so if I look, there's an element that's a pi times rational. When I multiply it, I get zero. And uh, OK, I should have said something maybe a little bit more about what a should be, but, uh, but OK. So if, uh, so let me maybe say the product of these is not a rational multiple of pi, it turns out in this case. And so if I have that number in particular, the image here is non-zero. So these two elements, the two elements that I cooked up, both have non uh, one has zero image here and one has non-zero image here. So okay, maybe this is not 100% accurate. Yeah, um, for your first uh, diagram, we just show uh, the, the morphism from a Cartesian product B to a tensor B. Like, what what would that morphism be? Yeah, so that's just the morphism where I take elements of A, B, and I just map it to the element A tensor B. Okay. Like, it's sort of, you know, just like A tensor B was built out of formally putting things together, that's just this map. Yeah. Um, so you can have a, a non-convex polyhedron with an internal angle which is greater than pi. So I was wondering how come we define the data invariant in using r mod pi z instead of 2 pi? Um, it's a good question. So I think so I did it just to help with the figures. Okay. In the sense that like here when I draw this edge, there's v and pi minus v. But it turns out that if I look at um, r tensor over z with r mod pi z, this is the same thing. Because I can transfer that extra factor of yeah. two. So it doesn't really matter to me. Right. I just decided to leave out the two for the convenience of that diagram. Mm -hmm. right. Now? Yeah. Okay. Are there any other questions? Okay, let's thank the speaker. If you still haven't checked in, like see me or another Eva member eventually, also eat the pizza and we have like an extra surprise.